and welcome back to ebook publication promotion episode part two Electric Boogaloo with refugees from the other publisher. How's everyone going? How's everyone Very going? Good. Doing I'm good. tired when I say yeah. going instead of doing. Right, doing good, to restart. <laughs> <laughs> right, regionalism so, What's that? Is that a regionalism? Uh, no, no, yeah. it's just uh, use the wrong word. Uh, <laughs> all right, so taking a look at what we did before, uh, we have Fantastic Toronto during the Drought of Magic. Uh, I'm not going to go over everything like we did at the end of the last video. You can find the last video, part one, and uh, and uh, praise yourself by zooming towards the end there. Uh, but basically, we have a, a, a sort of fairy tale version of Toronto where there was a magical drought at one point. Uh, there was a backlash. Uh, people turned on each other, uh, particularly the vampires. Uh, there was a false return of the magic, but only for 12 days. And ultimately, um, the new magic reality forms. And the last person to be the focus was Doug. So let's go to Matt. Matt, please define a focus. All right. So we had had the search for the cause. Uh, so the focus can be anything. It doesn't have to be a time period, right? Yeah, it could be any any noun, pretty much. Even well, actually, yeah, yeah, any noun. Let's say that. The only thing it can't be is something on the palette in the no section. Gotcha. So it doesn't have to be something we've already introduced, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, so, the, so on the palette, yes, and anything on the board. Okay. So I'm going with, uh, we've talked about the vampire, um, what was the word that was? We say harvest? Uh-huh. Yeah, the great vampire harvest. So I'm saying the vampire harvest and uh, the other races being blamed for the magical drought. All right. So then. Uh, as the focus, you go ahead and establish one or two items. Okay. This will be an interesting uh, comparison. See how the lighting affects uh, a different time of day in my room here. Well, it'll be interesting for me. It probably won't be interesting for anybody else. Unless you fade into blackness completely. <laughs> it's also hotter, so I'm sure I'm glistening with sweat. Yeah, I don't know if you notice it that far south, but we're definitely noticing the shorter days already. Oh, yeah. San Diego has two seasons. Actually, I take it back. Three seasons. The two weeks where it's too hot, the two weeks where it's too cold, and everything else. So is everything else just right? This is like the Goldilocks Pretty city much, of yeah. the world? <laughs> okay. So, Doug, do you have a primary publisher these days? Uh, no, I do not. I've <clears throat> um, my first collection was with PS Publishing in the UK, and the second collection was Chimeroscope, and that was, uh, of course, cheesing, mm -hmm. no longer in existence. Um, and then I did a nonfiction writer's guide. I um, indie published that, and my first novel I indie published as well, mm -hmm. um, which quite frankly, maybe the direction I continue on. Yeah, if you have the process down. Uh, Matt, how's it going? So I've added uh, a Excellent. new period, and under that is an event. OK, a uh, new period. Help me out here. Uh, so after the false return, I'm going to say, 
Uh, it's just sometimes when you click away from the Zoom call, it puts a little uh, window up in the corner of your screen, and it was covering what I was trying to look at. <laughs> so okay. Magical Race is fed up with being blamed uh, a lie against humans, and I hope I'm spelling a lie there properly yeah. as, as the verb. And uh, so there is an event that the Occult Times building is attacked. Mm, nice. So a, a question, um, how many factions are there? If they're a lying again, you mean a lie with themselves, amongst themselves? Yeah, because uh, we, we've mentioned the vampires, but um, there was hints somewhere in here that there are other supernatural um, beings. Mm -hmm. uh, so the blame on the least popular supernatural faction. So that says to me that there are at least three. All right. Can, can we say supernatural races? We haven't really defined them, but we did say that anybody can um use magic they just have to learn so there's no such thing as magical races i mean everybody is magical right we don't have any muggles it might be a, like a well that's a good point hmm but if, then i then i can say supernatural and that's good at it yeah i guess it was what we would what we would define as supernatural sitting here in in our world, but it would just be, you know, do we want to say that non-human races? I guess we've sort that? of missed the world building step of, you know, is it up to now we've only had vampires and humans. Mm -hmm. I just took it from um, at the very end of the, um, the scene, who shifted the blame for the vampires? and place the blame on the least popular supernatural faction. But I mean, we, we could just say that there are just uh, just vampires and humans. Right, least popular, which implies other supernatural factions. The factions could be political. You know, just a world that there's humans and, and, and vampires that have fallen into factions. But... Well, I think if we're going to have vampires, I think it's more interesting if we have other supernatural races as you now have it my question i'm fine with that I'm, my question is what are they are we just going with the we can just go forward from here in fact standard now, now that we that's the focus other races is part of it we all of us are allowed to define them now in this round so maybe that's okay. what our action should be okay uh so my turn i'm gonna let you guys talk while i plan it out okay interesting to hear about San Diego uh, living in Canada like Ottawa is definitely a four season city except uh, fall is fall and spring are, are pretty short and, and yet you mentioned it Doug that the, the days are getting shorter that I think it was this last weekend I looked outside and it was 8 30 8 o'clock and it was already dark when because um I'm from where I grew up uh, up here in Ottawa I'm far much farther north than than where I lived in. So it can it can be 10 o'clock and still be dusk, but that's right around um, the solstice. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's, you know, I, I, I love Toronto, I love Canada, but uh, the loss of light in the uh, in the winter season is, is the part I like the least. Yeah. Uh, there's an upside to working from home for me uh, is the office uh, where I'm working now is an internal office. So yeah. I get up, start, go to work, sun might be coming up, but then I don't see the sun all day. And by the time I get outside at, at 4.30, it's already dark. But, it's like dark all the time. Yeah. So did you have any plans for a uh, for the fall or winter that are now, oh, looks like Tone's back. Yeah, I added under the search for the cause, uh, the unsealed court retreats to the moon. Search for the cause. So that explains where half the fairies went. Okay. Is the unsealed court your own creation or is that something in, in Popular culture, mythology. Popular culture, yeah, mythology. Yeah, there's the Seelie and Unseelie Court. The Unseelie Court or the Winter Court. 
and they're a little bit more malicious. Okay. The fairies. So we've got fairies and vampires so far. On the one hand, it's kind of it's it's boilerplate. On the other hand, it's also kind of shorthand for <laughs> a lot of things too. All right, uh, that was my turn, Douglas. Your turn. Uh, Matt, we were talking where about. Is... Go ahead, Matt. What? What's your question? What... So tell me more about the Seely and Unseely court. Where and where is that? Where's that from? I think it's generally European. Um, I get. <laughs> I, I've seen it in both. Uh, World of Darkness, the role-playing game, and then uh, I think it's in Dresden Files, too. They call it the Summer yeah. and Winter Court there. Um, right. you know, it's hard to say what's the definitive of any of the stuff, since none of it actually exists, but... Um, yeah, I just started reading some, some Dresden Files books, which I had put off. I'm always shy away from something that's too popular. Uh, and too prolific, but they're really good audiobooks. It's, you can just drop in, and it's not hard to get caught up on it. Not a lot, of, you know. If you took out all the pop culture <laughs> references, the book would be twice as long. So, I mean, half as long, I should say. There's um, there's an author, um, Evan Monday, and forget the name of the book. Um, yeah, but he came to read. I, I hosted a reading series here in Ottawa for a couple of years, and he came to read. And he's just hilarious. And so he's reading this book, and he's dropping, like, all kinds of pop culture references, but not, like, Star Wars and stuff, but things that teenage girls are, are into and, like, not obscure, but just really of-the-moment popular culture. Mm -hmm. And so he's reading, and he says something like, if, if you didn't get that popular reference, I can explain it to you. And he thumbs to the end of the book, and he says, because I have a – compendium of all the pop culture references <laughs> I've made in this book. So if you're ever reading and you don't understand what was said, you can just go to the back. And so he read the description of the pop culture reference, which was also hilarious. That's actually the way to do it. Um, I was listening to an uh, interview with pa uh, Patton Oswalt, the comedian. And mm. one of the things he does is like comedy punch-ups on scripts. And when yeah. he was working on something, I think it was for, um, I think it might have been doing the punching up the script for Ratatouille, which he was in. He said the first thing okay. he does is he takes out all the, 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 the current event pop culture references because that stuff ages so terribly, and if you, if you like look at like old episodes of Mystery Science Theater three thousand, they'll be making a joke about a commercial that may be being overplayed on Comedy Central that week, um, yeah, which kind of works on that show because it has a Dada esque feel to it anyway, <laughs> so you're not gonna get all the jokes anyway. Um, but having having the uh, the guide to pop culture references is the good middle ground, I think. Is oh, there a, what's the the writing community like where you live? In Ottawa, mm -hmm. it's very strong. Uh, we've got a, a convention up here that is that is thriving, whereas a lot of conventions. Um, at least in at least in Canada, are, are uh, kind of on the on the downswing right now. That's not you know criticism of of any of them. It's just the the reality of, of the way things are and 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 fandom and and what the conventions are offering and what, what people are after. But this one here in Ottawa is is very well run. It's very well organized. Um, and so I'm plugged in with um, seven or eight writers up here. We're all in a, a critiquing group. And there's other there's other groups, so uh, it's it's a really really great community, which is um, ironic because people call Ottawa the city that fun forgot because <laughs> for the capital um, th there was a uh, a documentary I think called the city that fun forgot where I learned that aside from the Parliament building and the Supreme Court, a lot of the buildings here, the office buildings, are intentionally bland, intentionally mm -hmm. just steel and glass because. They don't want people thinking, oh, in Ottawa, they're spending our tax dollars on these lavish uh, buildings, when really, no, it's probably a private developer that's that was that mm -hmm. was doing it. But um, yeah, it's it's a really kind of uptight city and very different than Toronto. Like you go to Toronto and there's just this, this great feel of, of energy and that you don't have it here in Ottawa. But the writing community is really, really strong and, and well-connected and, and um, hmm. a, lot, a lot of energy, really good. 
right. looks like Douglas yeah. is done. I'd second what Matt says. I'm I'm often very jealous of not living in Ottawa. Hmm. Interesting. The group of writers that you hang with, Matt, pretty impressive. Yeah, they're good, and they're good people. They're good people. They're good people to hang with. Yeah, I mean, you got you got um, Hayden and Wiz and Derek and Kate Hartfield. Yeah. Up here, Marie Billado. All right, should we talk about what you added? Sure. All right. So I'm not sure about the sequencing, but um, this is sort of a result of the prior event. So the Sealy Court, which stays behind, they are starting to uh, to sense the growing hostility from the non-supernaturals, the humans. So they make an attempt to bring all the supernatural races, whatever councils they have, uh, in the city together for a summit and in, in hopes of forming a united front. Right. And I'm just saying that does not go well. All right. All right, Matt, now you are the lens again. So you again have the option of doing one or two. Um, I'm looking, Doug, where did you put that? Under the search for the cause. Hopefully I was allowed to do that. Yep. Oh, there it is. Okay. I guess. Right under the one that Tone added uh, previously, just previously. I think just something didn't refresh on my end. So, okay. And then Doug, you said you're in Toronto right now? Toronto boy, born and raised, yeah. yeah. I would like to say I've been to Toronto, but the only time I went up there was for World Fantasy, and I basically just passed through Toronto on my way to, was it Richmond? I, I have I have pictures to prove that you're in uh, World, uh, <laughs> World Fantasy on Toronto. It kind of felt like I just sort of zip lined into Canada and then shot right back out again, though. I didn't get to do any tourism stuff. Yeah, I actually, I did not know you were like, is San Diego recent? Have you, have you been there for a long time? No, pretty much since I was five. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was the, I think I was the author with that publisher that was the furthest away geographically. Okay. All right. That publisher that will not be named. <laughs> so what's this? Uh, you said you're jealous of the Ottawa scene then. What's it like in Toronto? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Matt's in a, in a writer's group with um, uh, a lot of my writer friends, but they, you know, it's a great group and they're all established pros. So he's, uh, mm. he's got a really good uh, kind of critique circle just built into his, his environment. Nice. What about you? Do you ever do um, like? Do you have a critique group? Do you have beta readers? What what's sort of your process for getting feedback? It's all very ad hoc. Um, we had a critique group while we were working. My wife and I were working on our last books, and then everybody in the critique group either uh, finished or left the country because the mob was after them. True story. Uh, so. <laughs> So that fizzled out, and then in the time since, uh, one more has left the country, not mob related, or at least the area. So uh, <laughs> I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> so uh, uh, if I'm ready to beta read again, I will. I will definitely reassemble a group. We do have uh, a chapter of the Writers Coffee House here. Jonathan Mayberry is the one who sort of really pushes that forward. If you've heard of it. And he happens, he moved to Del Mar uh, a couple of years ago and started up a chapter here in San Diego. And I've been part of that. So I'm, okay. I'm, I know a number of people who are um, at that level where they've got one published credit, basically my level, where they've got one or two published credit or maybe a sizable self-published body of work. And I've got I, a lot of people owe me favors on beta reads, so I'll be able to put that together. The process we had with the last group was everybody was beta reading chapter by chapter, and I don't want to do that again. That was just a, I think that slowed us all down ultimately. I think I'd prefer just to have the full book done and then beta read the whole thing at once, or maybe even in thirds. But yeah, because I could always I use that, the way I do it. Go ahead. I could always use that as an excuse not to write. It's like, well, I've got my submission in, there's no point in writing beyond and that. I gotta, gotta wait. You can't go ahead. Yeah. yeah. 
my uh, with critique group the way I, I do it um, I tend to write in chunks anyway I think I mentioned the last time I'll do three four or five chapters and I'll submit that mm. so they tend to be pretty big chunks or like you know 10 12 thousand words um, and I just keep going but that I call that that's kind of my alpha read is my critique group and then I've got beta readers when I have a finished what I think is a is a finished uh, novel I use the beta readers for and they're they're not writers they're strictly strictly or some Scott Card's word of a uh, term of wise readers yeah. I have I don't have that relationship with anyone yet I mean I haven't asked I suppose I could just do that how did it, how did you build your 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 wise readers then uh, it was off my mailing list. I, I reached out to what I call my VIP group, and these are just like the people who open open my newsletter on a regular basis, and and whose name keep names keep showing up and posting reviews to Amazon for my work and stuff like that. So That's they're basically great. people who who like my writing, um, and so I I just put a call out on my newsletter, and I said. I'm about to start, uh, or I've just finished the first book in a in an urban fantasy trilogy. Anybody want to be a beta reader? Mm -hmm. Your your compensation is you get mentioned in the um, you know in the forward and the, the dedication, and and you'll get a free signed copy of the book. Um, and that that's it. And yeah, I had um, I think I had about five the first time. Um, I sort of did not invite one of them back for the second book because their feedback was, yeah, I really liked it. <laughs> that was it. That was, that was the entire feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I had kind of coached them before they signed up, I said, okay, this is what you're going to have to do to be a beta reader. Uh, but the other ones are um, uh, the ones I have from that list. And I also have a good writer friend um, uh, down in the U.S. who I met through writers workshops with. Chris, Chris Rush and Dean Wesley Smith. So I've got right now, I got four really good ones that I trust. That's but great. they, uh, they, they put in the homework. I mean, you'll get back a red line, you know, word document, uh, with lots of comments. So <laughs> it's quite cool. Not line edits, but you know, story flow and continuity and, and character motivate motivation, consistency, and just structure and pacing. It's great. So nice. It's great. So that's how I found them. And um, after the first book, I said, yeah, I'm keeping these. <laughs> keeping <laughs> yeah. these. They were great. How's it going, Matt? Good, I'm done. All right, let's see what you got. Where, so you got? Uh, under down below the great vampire harvest drives the vampire clans underground, I added a new event, which is the vampires seize the unearthly vehicle. Nice. And so the scene, um, which I guess I should say that this is part of the vampire harvest. This is kind of in, re in retaliation for, for what they're doing. That's why it's still part of the focus. But um, the question is, what is the nature of the vehicle? And we have the vampires uh, having learned uh, that there is a vehicle and, and where it is, how they learn that, hey, that's for later in the game. Um, <laughs> but they go there, they, they you know, they're not curious. They're, they go there with intent. They, I'm using the verb swarm. They swarm the location and, and take it. But uh, the vampires um, are drained or they die uh, trying to move uh, the vehicle. I guess I should say that those, are, those would be the magical vampires. And so the answer to the, the question of the nature of the vehicle is that it drains magic. This is where we're going to have that reveal. Mm -hmm. um, it, might, it might be the reason that all the magic is gone. And so even the dead corpses of the magic using vampires cannot, uh, they're empty. There's no magic in them uh, that can be harvested. Excellent. Cool. So a question, um, yes. so we have the, um, the vampires and I assume the other supernatural creatures are imbued with magic. Are humans as well or are humans just magic users? In other words, if humans seize this thing, would they have been drained of anything? Well, I'm, I just... I just changed the edit slightly to say that the, um, the, the vampires that use magic are, okay. um, are, are killed. So I'll, I'll assume that we have vampires as a different race, uh, and there are some that use magic, and the ones that do use magic uh, are the ones that, that are killed. Okay. That's an interesting distinction. Right. Thank you. 
So do we, I'm just sorry, I was just trying to understand the world we're, we're building here. So I think we all are. <laughs> yeah. And I'm fine. I'll build on anything you got. I just want to make sure I don't put in something that suddenly conflicts with everything. So we started, I thought, by saying that magic is something not hereditary. Learned, not hereditary. Anyone can do magic. Yeah, we're not not hereditary, things. but we we do have that it can be cannibalized from supernatural corpses. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that to me implies that there are people who races that have magic in them I guess if we got the vampires who can use magic and vampires who can't that kind of goes against the anyone can use magic by learning it I think the distinction is magic vampires uh, who do use magic who know magic and <laughs> vampires who can't so they're, okay. they're a vampire okay. and a magician at the same time But I mean, I'm also I'm also open to going back to maybe one of the things is we're in a world that's like ours, except magic was introduced at some point, and so all these magical beings came into being. And if the magic goes away, then they go we're away. Die. And we kind of realize that humans are the only true um, biologically based life form, and everyone else is biology plus some form of magic. Yeah, I, I kind of like that because it ups the stakes and also explains why humans would turn on the supernatural groups. Mm -hmm. Because they sort of have the magic and it would seem that humans would think that they're, they're somehow taking it back. But that would imply that all the vampires have magic as part of them. So they'd all be affected. I guess that's all I'm trying to get. Yeah, yeah I'm, I, I like that. I like that, Reed. I like I like that the idea of that magic disappearing from the world doesn't just mean that the technology basis of this world is falling apart. It's genocide, genocides for all the base, all the races that no one really ever thought of as being magic based because they've always been here. And now we're starting to realize as the fairies are failing, the vampires are failing, what, whoever else we want to introduce are failing, but the humans are just fine uh you know I, I like that that's up that's also upping stakes and it also introduces conflict of why are the humans the the odd species out you know and maybe are they not to get too ahead of the game but are they the ones to blame for the yeah. magic failing because they're trying to wipe out everyone else yeah i yeah i, I really like that because it's just another reason for them all to start fighting with each other all right I like so it. just then one edit on your last one is that we don't really have magic using vamps. We all the vamps have magic, just like the Fae and the whoever else we're going to introduce. Going back and do that now. Okay. So basically, it drains magic from the vamps who get too close trying to move this vehicle. I guess. So what happens to the vehicle, Matt? Um. Do they move yeah, it that, yeah. and then die, or <laughs> do they move it and then realize I'm not feeling so good? Yeah, let's say they can't move it. Okay. I'll wrap that in. All right. So while he's making those edits, uh, Douglas, it's your turn to add a legacy and play a legacy event or period or scene. So again, a legacy can be anything that's on the board. So actually, no, I take that back. Anything that was introduced in the last round or touched on. So I'm adding something new. So right now we have Mary Poe and Unearthly Vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anything, sorry, uh, added in this most recent round today? Uh-huh. Okay. So not something from the first one. Now, you can also add a legacy and play off something that either Mary Poe or the Unearthly Vehicle. 
So it's two okay. separate actions. Well, I'll just ask, John. I mean, if um, I was going to get back to what happens after Byron and his friends discover the vehicle, I was trying to link how the vampires find out about the vehicle. Okay, well, yeah, it sounds like you want to add something about the vehicle. That's fine. Um, but, and I, I mean, I suppose it's an option that you don't have to add a legacy to the list, but you get the important part down. Yeah, so let me try again. When I heard you talking with Doug about his um, his critique group and uh, the challenge that you had, I uh, I was able to find my group through Facebook in 2006, mm. and there's barely anybody on Facebook. It's just uh, I found a like a Canadian or, or Ottawa based writers group and just put the call out saying I'm I'm a writer. I'm looking for somebody to you know read my work and critique it, and I'm you know of course willing to do that as well. And that's how I met. Uh, my friend Dar Kunskin, who's uh, been really, really successful in, in sci-fi uh, here in Canada, and you know, it's, it's uh, I'm really grateful that I was able to to hook up with that group. So, did you? And was there a sort of vetting process to that? For Derek and I, no. We we um, I was going to say we were both starting out at the same place, but that's not true entirely because when I first met Derek, he had an acceptance letter from Isaac Asimov magazine in his in his back pocket. <laughs> But we just we just met. Um, I think I'd sold one story. Uh, Derek had had the Asimov's acceptance letter, so we were like brand new to writing seriously. Like we were um, in our mid thirties at that point, and so we're just just grateful. We we had a rapport. We got along very well, and so no, there was no real vetting. It was just I'll read your work if you read mine, and. Afterwards, uh, Derek found uh, Hayden Trenholm, who's a writer here in Ottawa. His, uh, I think, I think Derek went through um, uh, Aurora Award winners, which is a Canadian award, and found any that were in Ottawa and reached out to them. And Hayden, Hayden was one of the ones who came on board. And Hayden, being the more senior writer, he had a, you know, an established writing career uh, when when we first met him, was the one to say we need to be vetting people. And by vetting, it's just do we get along? Are they willing to critique as well as be critiqued? But also, we should all try to be at the same level of um, uh, where we are in our career, mm -hmm. which wasn't entirely true. But we don't have anybody who's, let's say, a bestseller or uh, you know, multiple award winner or Hollywood bigwig. You know, we're all we we all started essentially the same place. And Derek has gone on to to really great things. But with Derek, he took a couple of years off from work and churned out some just amazing novels. And so he's he's got a number of novels under his belt. But yeah, the the um, uh, the vetting process was important because we have had people who wanted to join, and uh, before we will critique their work, we ask them to critique some of ours. And some some people are just great. Like like Doug was mentioning, they have the skills and they understand how stories work, and they're able to give constructive feedback. Others not so much. And so because it is a critiquing group, it's not do we like you, and we're also not. That the purpose of the group isn't to hang out and talk about writing because I've heard <laughs> some folks talk about writing groups that are just therapy sessions. Um, I shouldn't I shouldn't say that. That's that sounds condescending to, um, uh, to mental health professionals. But a chance to get together more for for mutual support than than um, than the writing. Mm -hmm. And so even though we're friends and there's the mutual support uh, when we get together for a critiquing session, it's very serious, and uh, that's that's why we're there. And then the socializing happens afterwards. I've, so it's uh, good. Like they, I've tried to do beta re exchanges with people online, and that's very hit or miss. Um, yeah, this one guy I didn't realize he was writing uh, furry fiction, 
uh, set in North Korea. And uh, it was, I had nothing to say <laughs> about it. Yeah. It's one of the good things is, is in my group, we all, we all write speculative fiction. So I'm myself and another writer named Jeff Gander are the only ones who really write horror. Mm -hmm. And the others are more science fiction or, or fantasy, but I, I do write some, some sci-fi. A um, little, little bit of what could be considered fantasy, but it's all, you know, if you you can you can you can talk about the different tropes in the genre, but then good storytelling is good storytelling. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll get feedback that, well, you know, how about this or how about that, and I'm able, and then when it's my time to to speak, um, or we start saying, well, what I'm trying to work for is horror. Uh, um, Tony Huff said, dark fantasy, the hero. Um, uh, triumphs in horror they endure yeah and so i get some feedback on the ending is a little bit of a downer and trying to say well that's kind of the tone i'm going for but um it's it's always good to get the different feedbacks and now i've got all of their feedback from other works in my head so as i'm writing i know ah like derek is really good at this particular thing and he wouldn't let me get away with this or you know, aiden's good at this i not gonna let me get away with this so it's like they're always over my shoulder as i'm as i'm writing mm -hmm. The, the last group I was with, uh, out of the six of us, two of us were not um, speculative trope savvy. And there was an advantage to that is the assumptions that we would make amongst ourselves, they would pick up and go, what, what is that? So we, we knew yeah. that was sort of like a weak point that should be addressed in some way. Uh, Douglas. I'm done. Done. Okay. I'm done. What you got? Okay. Where is it? First of all, the legacy I added was the supernatural factions. Okay. We're in a little bit of more about that. And then tied to that, under the um, the last event under the search for the cause, the event where Byron and his friends stumble on a strange cult worshipping an unearthly vehicle. I've forgotten about the cult. Oh, well. Um, I've added a scene. That's what happens when Byron and his friends discover the vehicle. Riding their bikes through a Toronto ravine, the boys stumble on the glowing vehicle. Fascinated, they, they approach. That's the scene. And what happens is um, a vampire friend of Byron's in that group, whose father just happens to be on the Vampire Council, mm -hmm. falls unconscious when they get too close. Byron and his human friends manage to get them away. But of course, the father is going to find out. So I was trying to tie it into how the um, the vampires decide to go after the uh, the vehicle. All right, cool. All right, so that was our run where the the focus was the vampire harvest and other races willing for drought. And now I am the lens, so I'm going to start thinking about a focus while you guys keep talking about yourselves. Cool. I, I think I heard you say, Matt, that you kind of have rules for admitting new people to the. Uh, to the critique group yeah uh, we we try to keep the number low and uh, kind of I think we've got eight active members right now and so so when uh, someone someone goes either moves away or life you know kind of gets in the way that's that's when we have a vacancy and we haven't we haven't had a new member in a long long time but uh, when somebody does want to come in we will ask them to critique a couple of stories before we will look at their work. And just to see, do they have the skills? Are they, you know, are they able to, as, as you were you were mentioning, uh, look at flow, look at motivation, look at consistency. Um, and even just the, the basic things that, that you learn of, you know, the, the as you know, Bob's or, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the perfect um, protagonist. Uh, and just see, do they have the chops to, to deliver a really good critique? And it's almost to the point of secondary of, are they a good writer or not? Well, that's really not a, a reason to be admitted into the critique group. It's can they give a good critique? Because we know we can give good critiques. So hopefully if they're not great writers, we can we can try to improve, uh, try to improve their writing. And also there's, of course, the notion of we have to, we have to like them. We have to get along. That's yeah, no, you're right. We, we, we have something very similar. It's They do have to submit a, a piece of writing and we have to decide that they're sort of, they're critiquable or they're at the point where, you know, it's it's close enough to being published that, that a critique can help them focus it. And then 
assuming they pass that by they they show up at a meeting which are all virtual now and they're basically we're getting we're judging them on two things one is exactly what you said what value is, is their critique can they actually provide uh, valuable feedback to to the other writers and the other one is somewhere again can we all get along it's how they react to a to a critique yep because we've we've asked some people to leave over the years for the one like they just don't react to um to getting uh constructive feedback to their writing so if they're there to just to hear how wonderful their story is that's you want to catch that early our, our group we're lucky that we do get along and we're all really good friends and we will see each other socially uh that sometimes there are critiques that are that are very sharp and, and on point and the person didn't like it and has can express the reasons why they didn't like it and uh, the way our the way our group works which I, I think is kind of kind of standard but it's everyone goes around and the author doesn't respond until the last person has given their critique yeah yeah and I agree. so some sometimes that'll be like I'll be waiting I'll be waiting and Derek will be going and I'm going through my notes like yep Derek covered that yep Derek covered that yep Derek covered that and so I won't have too much to add, but I might put my own spin on on, on what he what he uh, what he says, and then the writer uh, can can reply. And, and it might be none of you picked up on this. What I was trying to do was this, and there can be a little bit of discussion to try to try to really help make the story as best uh, that that they can. Uh, but what's what can be funny, and I'm sure you you've had this too, is um, somebody will say, "I really really love this story. Like this really really spoke to me, and I, I thought it moved along well." And here's like my 28 bullet points of, of what's wrong with it. But I find that the stories that are really, really good are where the sharpest critique comes from. You know, it's kind of like a, a, a sculpture made of wood. And if I think some more chunks need to be carved off with a chisel, that'll come off with the chisel. But if this piece is almost absolutely perfect, it's time to get out the very fine sandpaper and get it down to uh, and polish it to to uh, something really really special. Yeah, yeah, we we pretty well the same thing. You don't you don't speak. You can ask clarifying questions. Like if someone makes a comment, you go, you can kind of put up your hand. Now that we're doing it in Zoom, just to say okay, because you're trying to take notes, and if you're not quite sure what their point is, it's hard to take notes. The other one we have is is if if you've got the same point, and this is really visually effective. If someone makes a point. And you agree with it it's one you were going to make you just silently you just put up your thumb so if the the writer is kind of looking around the table and, and someone makes a point and like you know sorry the opening is really slow um and everyone says that then you really can't argue with that your opening slow yeah yeah i think most most groups that have been in existence for a while you know there may be some slight differences in, in modes of operation but they all come to the same conclusion of you know that type of approach yep. and it's it's really helped me as a writer uh, because people will introduce different concepts or different techniques or different you know you, you read somebody's work enough and you, you come to realize what their what their strengths but also their weaknesses is and I'm not gonna not gonna say who it is because I don't want to, to out them or make them think they're they're a bad writer. But more than half the time, we'll get a story from this this author, and they're trying not, and I respect this, trying not to spoon feed the reader with, here's what's happening. You know, you want the reader to to work a little bit, hopefully be a little bit of engaged to be, you know, what 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 was that little detail right there? I wanna I wanna follow that a little bit. But what can end up happening with this writer's work is they don't. They don't provide quite enough in the first draft and so we'll all be sitting around and, and saying to this person i really like the tone of the story but i'm not quite sure what happened and then this this person will explain okay here's what's happening it's 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 not set in the present it's actually set in the past and, blah, 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 and the, the thing with that blah, 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 blah. it's like oh okay now i get it but we didn't see any of that in the first story and so when when you get a piece you you, sh you should go in with no preconceived notions but you're always kind of looking for that of all right is there enough of the detail um that's textual versus subtextual to keep me interested in the story because i can follow basic plot yeah it's the it's a challenge with exposition um, oh yeah 
and you know it's my favorite metaphor is it's like watering a plant right you don't want to you give it too much water you're going to kill the plant so you'll you'll bury your reader under a boring exposi exposition dump or if, if you don't give them enough it's your situation where you know they they die of, of a drought of information they have no idea what's going on you got to trickle it out it's my favorite metaphor for uh, for exposition give them enough to have them fascinated so they're not they're interested but they're not confused doing critiquing is, is such a good way to, to learn things of your own writing that you might not realize um, you're doing uh, and and also reading slush I found is also a good way where you don't you don't need to be that level of critical because it's a yes no uh, decision but uh, I was I was reading some slush for a uh, for a for a market and uh, what I took away from it having read a number of the stories is I tend to repeat beats the idea of we're going along the story and then okay here's here's something important that's that's structurally important to the story. I will sometimes do that two or three times with the same the same beat, thinking, aha, remember this? And reading stories in a slush pile and seeing that being done, it kind of realizes, no, you're losing your, the first one is, even loses its impact because of this, the second or third that come after it. And that really helped me sharpen my writing of, you get to reveal this piece of information to either change the story or enlarge the story one time. And so it better work and that, that so just even reading slush really really helped me as a writer but it's because i learned to read critically not just do i like this yes or no yeah no, exactly and you're right i mean providing good focus feedback is is uh is a skill that most writers have to develop they may be excellent writers but they have no way to give feedback and then giving feedback in a way that does not crush the uh the writer is, is another skill too so you got to find uh, you got to find something that you know you like in the story, which for me is why you know the, the writer has to be at a certain level before I think they're, they're a good candidate for the group. Tone, you're done. Yeah. All right. I added. Uh, so my focus is the unearthly vehicle and its destination, and then all the way at the end, uh, the unearthly vehicle returns to the moon, and then I nested a scene in that. Why did the unearthly vehicle land in the same crater where the Unseelie Fae settled? The vehicle <laughs> lands in the center of the Unseelie settlement, digs through the moon dust, and docks with something. The docking device activates and powers up a fleet of unearthly vehicles buried on the moon. They take to the sky, shredding the Unseelie settlement, flying back to every continent of Earth. How do I scroll side to side? Oh, yeah, you got to use the arrows uh, right and left. On the keyboard. Ah, keyboard. Okay, because I was looking for on-screen arrows. Yeah, or uh, yeah, I don't know if why. You, if you got a mouse pad, there. if you got a mouse pad, you can go left and right on that too. Using a traditional mouse. Yeah. I could okay, use a mouse so... pad. But my computer is weird that the the um, webcam is at the bottom of the screen, so that's why you're looking up my nose. Ah. And so if I was to use my my mouse pad, or if I was to type anything. <laughs> So I've got peripherals plugged in. Well, it's worth it to see inside your nostrils. Speak for yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I got a little, uh, I added a little sort of uh, ancient alien stuff there. Okay. So I flipped that around and so is this meant to be the, uh, the, the climactic, like the ending scene of the book? There was, did I accidentally, I think I might've accidentally removed an event. I'm sorry. There was something about uh, the unearthly vehicle uh, technology becoming. Uh, it was shared with other. Yeah. yeah. So let me just add that back <clears throat> down here. Oh, so this precedes that event. Yes. Okay, alrighty. So I'll flip your question around. Then why did the Unseelie Fay uh, actually go to that location when they uh, were put? To the that moon? could be determined. Okay.
curious about this um, this approach and this technology that, uh, I mean, even just this website, I can definitely see the utility of using it to outline your work. Mm -hmm. And that if you wanted to you know, invoke your own focus, so go, out, go outside the gaming rules of you have to do this, you have to do that, but sit down, it's like, okay, today I'm going to work on um, what's my villain's backstory and where would that fit in? Because I do like that this is all sticky note format because I tend to have my, um, my, my outlines are, you know, just, just a, a word document and I might have like, have it in a table where the, the a column that's mostly plot and then some notes in, in the other side. But I like that this is, um, mm -hmm. this lays it all out. You might want to look at uh, Trello, I think it's called. It's a project management software that's web interface like this. And it's basically um, nested, you know, take out all, it's this, but take out all the rules of the game. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that might serve your purpose. Yeah, I've, I've heard of Trello for um, for something completely different, um, more for a workflow management in a, uh, in a team that has limited capacity. So you have, you know, like, 120 person hours during the week and trying to find, figure out a way to figure out that nobody's going to be overwhelmed, but you also don't have too much excess capacity. Mm -hmm. And so what someone was describing is just the visual nature of that allows you to have different blocks for, um, for the work you're being asked. And if all those blocks can fit inside that shape, you've got enough, you're good. If it's overflowing, then, then you're not good. So mm -hmm. all that is to say, the, um, uh, I hadn't, I'd, I'd heard of Trello, but I didn't know it could be used for that. So now I'm doubly interested to check it out. Uh, Douglas, are you working on your contribution? I am not. Okay. You got to tell me these things. I need to be directed. <laughs> Bad game master. So, so what? I was waiting for your uh, your final um, adjustment there. So oh, no, I'm done. You're done. Okay. So I I will have to still ask though that. Um, if you hadn't had the uh, bit about shredding the unsealy settlement, does that include shredding the unsealy court as well? Uh, I mean, as a political structure, probably. So without that, I would say, hmm, looks like this is being triggered by the unsealy court. But obviously not. So uh, now it's. Uh, you know, that's a good point. Why don't I remove that just to make it more flexible? Yeah. Otherwise, it seems very coincidental that they happen to land in the very spot on the, the moon. Good point. The moon is bigger than that. Yeah. I mean, something seems to link it. If nothing links it, then it's coincidental. And that kind of is, yeah, no. I just hate the Ancelia so much. I want to see them suffer. They okay. can still suffer. Maybe, maybe they were lured there by some false indication of magical sources. I don't know. Okay, so now and what do I, I do? Change, I, I gotta did. change the question too. Because that's unsealy. Okay, so I'm changing it to what did the unseal earthly vehicle find on the moon? There we go. So it took all the oh I gotta take the unsealy settlement stuff reference out of there too. Sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. I always overbuild stuff. I'm just trying to there we go. Connect the dots here. Okay, sir sorry, Tone, what do I add now? Uh the focus is the unearthly vehicle and its destination, and you can add one card. I think I'll just call them cards from now on, just rather than saying period event or scene. Okay. Yeah, so being from San Diego, I go to Comic-Con a lot. Uh, this is the first year yeah. I've missed since 2000, I think. My first, Holy cow. my first one was, uh, I believe, 84. It was the last one in, uh, it used to be in a, like an old timey fancy hotel that had been mm. way past its prime uh, up on the hill. Now it's fancy condos. Um, 
Yeah, it it has its advantages, kind of, you know, being in the hometown of the biggest pop culture convention. But because we live here, we don't the networking that happens late at night we miss because we we live, yeah. you know we stay at home. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars in a hotel just in the town where I live. Um, so we miss we do miss out on that part. But what like, was it? Because I, I saw something go by that Comic-Con was just comics, but there was one seminal event that happened that is what led to it becoming this phenomenon. And I don't know if it was a trailer was announced. It might have been the, um, the Star Wars release. Um, I do have a, actually, I do have an interesting Comic-Con story from one of the founders, my friend Mike Towery. So it was him and a bunch of teenagers who wanted to create this uh, thing. And they still really didn't have a vision. Um, but they did. somebody did tell them that you need a big name person to show up at your first one if you're going to draw any attendance. And they knew that uh, Ray Bradbury was up in L.A. And they were like, okay, let's go up there, make our pitch, and see what we can do. And they, 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 they make their pitch, and he says, kids, you got a great idea, but I'm sorry, I only do um, educational events now. And one of the guys there, I don't know which one it was by name, but he says, as the idea is coming to him, the words are coming out of his mouth. But we're a nonprofit educational uh, establishment for the promotion of uh, awareness of popular culture in society, <laughs> and that's why it's a nonprofit organization. <laughs> that's great, but I mean, you 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 adapt. You you do what you need to do to, <laughs> yeah. to get it. And I think that a lot of conventions. Um, Actually, I don't know if how many of them are for profit or not for profit, but I would have to imagine if any of them were for profit, at least the ones I've 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 been to, it would be a really hard sell because a lot of them break even. Uh, a lot of the organizers say they put in their own money, and sometimes we'll have to to cover you know, certain certain expenses and this fundraising. So I mean, it, it almost makes sense to, to do that. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know. We've got a we've got a Comic Con here in Ottawa that started. I don't know six seven years ago now mm -hmm. and um it's it's it well we should be lucky that that we have it because a lot of my friends who uh, uh a friend of mine um uh, is uh, traditionally published and also self-publishes there's a there's a press up here called renaissance press that puts out um that puts out books i don't i'm gonna say a handful but i don't i don't want to make it sound like they're they're not you know doing good work, but they're not putting out like 100 books a year uh, either. But they're local here to Ottawa. There's all kinds of artists. Uh, like I said, the, the city that that fun forgot, it's not just writing. That the first Comic-Con I went to and I thought, oh, there's going to be you know, a thousand people at this like this massive, huge uh, convention space that's out by the airport. It's huge. I show up and there are stormtroopers. There are cosplay sword video game i didn't even know what they were there were jawas there were there was everything and it really surprised me that in this city there are that many people with one who would come out but two had the costumes and had the you know the paraphernalia that that's you know your, your geek cred and i'm there and just um you know you can you can see i'm wearing a, my uh, archer and, and rick, rick sanchez shirt here but this is as far as my geek cred went like i didn't have this back then but uh, <laughs> It was just it was just amazing to see in this uh, in this really buttoned down sleepy city uh, all those all those people and and what happened was they they didn't expect it either and so they had lines going out into the parking lot it was a really bright day and to their credit they were struggling to set up uh, you know like not tents but the little coverings that people so they wouldn't be out in the sun and handing out bottles of water because they were just not expecting the crowds. Mm. And that's that's also one of the reasons why I, I mentioned I did a reading series before. Um, it was based on one that was in Toronto. Was uh, the um, the cheese series that that Cheesing Publications um, uh, mm -hmm. sponsored and, and put together, and that had been going in Toronto for a couple of years. And I wanted to do one here in Ottawa, but I just really wasn't sure. And seeing all those people told me, okay, there are people who will come out for for a reading series of a uh, speculative fiction. So that was uh, that's that's my um, Comic Con story. But we don't we don't do the trailers. It's not as big. Nothing is as big as San Diego. But we'll get yeah. like Gillian Anderson or you know a couple of uh, um, who's the guy from Star uh, Keith Urban. Like those those level of um, mm -hmm. of, uh, of celebrities will come up. 
Yeah, in the 90s when there was that comic book industry crash, you know, the, the post-image crash. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Comic-Con really struggled, and they, that's when they really invited Hollywood and the toy companies in full force, and that's what really kind of redefined Comic-Con. You can still find the old experience there. You just have to look harder for it. Mm -hmm. Still in the cracks. So I'll go um, when Comic Con comes, because you know, if unless there's somebody I really really want to see, I'll buy like a day pass uh, for I think I think the Sunday because it's only half a day is is uh, is cheaper than the Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'll go and I'll wander around and, and you know pick up some things and and uh, say hi to people who who I know there. But but mostly it's just there to people watch. And I think the best um, costume I ever saw was somebody who was dressed as Tyler Durden from Fight Club. But I don't know if you remember in the movie or if you've seen the movie, but he's got this bathrobe that has coffee mugs uh -huh. on it. Uh, and so it was in the, the, the sunglasses <laughs> uh, and, 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 a, and I think a coffee cup. And it was just, it was obscure, but it was just, you could tell there's so much love put into that costume. <laughs> uh, there, there's a sort of cosplay um, anthology videos on YouTube. We were watching a lot of those when Comic-Con was not happening this year, just sort of to get that fix again. And this one guy had a costume. It was a complete black bodysuit. And all along his left side, he had these pixelated plates. And then when he turned, uh -huh. it was a two, like a 2D scroller guy with a gun. It could, <laughs> I'm not sure if this is making it come alive, but a lot of space to work with here. <laughs> I think, I think okay, I'm, I'm finally done here. All right. All right, Doug, what you got? Okay, so I have added under the search for the cause period mm -hmm. uh, after the Unseelie court retreats to the moon, an event, sorry, a scene. Uh, the question is, what drew the Unseelie court to the moon? And I've got the scene itself is the Unseelie court meet to discuss the detection by a fey farseer of an extraordinary energy source on the moon. All right. The answer is, with no understanding of science, the NCOA court assume the energy is magical. They leave for the moon to escape, both to escape growing hostility against supernaturals and to seize the new magic source, what they think is magic. Excellent. Okay. All right, Matt, your turn. We want to take, um, we've been at this an hour. Do we want to take um, a couple of minutes? Oh, sure. Yeah. We want a bio break. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to uh, check the Raptors score. <laughs> They're in the third. So I, I'd, uh, I'm going to give a timeout pretty soon because I'd, I'd at least like to watch the last quarter. Uh, well, do you just want to wrap it up here then? Would that work for you? Up to you guys. I, don't, you know, I know you've set the time aside. I'm, I'm, this is, this has been fun. This has been a good way to, you know, a good hour. And I think, um, you know, I, I, now that we kind of understand the game, I've got a couple of ideas of, of what I might want to put someplace. Uh -huh. And I think okay. it's always better to be thinking, you know, if, if we want to meet again, you know, come into it. So, you know, always, always don't write until you're out of ideas, <laughs> you know, step away when you have a scene you want to write. So that way, you know, you can hit the ground running. So, uh, yeah, why don't we, why don't we wrap it up here? This has been a lot of fun. Okay. All right. Well, let's see. I don't know, let's see. Switch the camera. Okay, so I'm just gonna talk about the things that I've added to our world since then. So let's see, we got, um, that was new. Actually, this better if I just go everything again. All right, so everything was fine until magic disappeared. Transportation accidents when magic-based vehicles fail. Uh, so big cataclysm. Uh, how do the powers be react to the sudden falling of magic? And then the hospitals crashed. We had the search for the cause, and now we've introduced this term, the Unseelie and Seelie Courts. The Unseelie Courts fucks off to the moon because they discussed a, discovered a new magic system there. Uh, source of magic, rather. The Seelie Court tries to uh, end the hostility and does not go well by when they align with the others. Supernatural beings, that is. Uh, let's see, this is all old stuff about the vampires. Uh, Byron and his vampire buddy uh, discovered the, the unearthly vehicle cult. Um, while riding their bikes, because that's you know must be in the eighties, I guess. Uh, you don't know Toronto, dude. Oh, you still ride kids on bikes there? Oh yeah. Okay. 
Uh, let's All see. the ravines of bike paths. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I, I like the ravine reference. That's something I really like about Toronto is you're in a really urban area and then all of a sudden the ground just falls away. <laughs> well, not suddenly yeah, like, falls away in time, but like you're you're at the edge of a ravine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also had the vampires try and seize the unearthly vehicle but wound up getting their magic drained and dying in the, con in the consequence. Uh, what else did we add? Uh, nothing in that era. And then the uns the unearthly vehicle returned to the moon, uh, and and re <laughs> returned to the moon and activated a whole fleet of them and came back and now we're in a enlightened era of unearthly vehicles that run on well, who knows what. All right, well this is that sounds like almost the scene that that begs for Jeff Goldblum to be looking up at the sky, being a, I told you guys that was a bad <laughs> idea. Yes. <laughs> All right, so once again, this has been a promotion of our Story Bundle, the exclusive dark fantasy and sci-fi bundle. It's available on storybundle.com slash exclusive and is available for like another seven, eight days? To the 9th, yeah, September 9th September at midnight. 9th, uh, at midnight San Diego time, actually, <laughs> it goes. Uh, so it's uh, $5 at the lower level, was that it? And then five and then i think 14 for the whole the whole bundle of 11 bucks all right so i don't think you're going to get a better deal right now uh all right you gentlemen, won't. thank you very much and we will wrap thanks up. tom thanks matt it's been all fun right. thanks guys have a good night see you next time